Thank you very much. You know, when I got the invitation to come to Antarctica, I thought that was pretty cool. I'd come down and see some glaciers and feel the wind in my face, maybe snap a few penguin pics. Be fun, right? And um, so that's the way I arrived. Not passionate, but, but excited and interested and looking for a good time. And then one of the first people our group meets is Rose. And Rose is introduced as the medic. Feeling sick? See Rose. Fine. So the rest of the day, every time I went around a corner, there's Rose. <laughs> She's mopping the floor, fixing the wall, repairing the door. Rose. <laughs> and as I got to be here a little longer, I realized this place is full of roses. <laughs> it's full of it. And that brought me home because NASA is full of roses. People who have the passion, people who will do anything for the mission, people who uh, spend their nights, weekends, holidays, whatever it takes to get this thing done for the mission. And uh, at NASA, at one point, a very small part of that mission was to put me off the planet. And people ask me, were you scared? Were you scared on the launch pad? Was that frightening? And I can honestly say it was not. It was not scared. I'd addressed the risks and that sort of thing before I went. I wasn't scared. But I was terrified that I would get there and disappoint the roses. That I would not be able to justify the effort and, and trust that they put in me to get the job done. So another day goes by, and I'm at the bar, and I meet Pierre. Now, Pierre is a soil scientist. He's a fellow who has a gleam in his eye when he talks about dirt. <laughs> and in about 20 minutes, taught me more about dirt than I ever thought I would know. And Pierre is also a very frustrated soil scientist because he's here at Scott Base and not where he needs to be which is out in the dry valleys. Through the issues with weather, logistics, or whatever, Pierre's stuck here. So he's trying to be a good rose while he's here. Um, but you know that that is not where his heart is. And as we're talking, and I understand the passion of Pierre, he says to me, you know, one of the reasons I have to get out there is, and I'm paraphrasing here a bit, he says, because the roses have put so much effort into making this possible for me, I have an obligation to go out and do the science that will justify the investment that they've made in me. And I was like, holy Toledo, this guy is just like me. I'm a Pierre. <laughs> NASA has a bunch of Pierres, too. So. How did I get to be a Pierre? How'd that happen? I wanted to fly in space my whole life, ever since, I, literally as long as I can remember. I was the kid hanging on the fence out at the airfield and watching the planes take off. It's all I wanted to do. And in first grade, that was great, because pretty much everybody else, that's all they wanted to do, and everybody was an astronaut, and all the adults were wonderful. It's like, yeah, kid, good, yeah, you're going to go to space. By sixth grade, maybe five or six friends still wanted to do it. And by high school, I was the only one I knew that wanted to be an astronaut. But that's OK. I go see the guidance counselor for my big day. She's going to tell me how to, how to do it. I'm, I'm sure she's going to tell me what I need to do to become an astronaut. And we get in there, and, and she's flipping through the pages. And she says, I see you want to be an astronaut. That's going to be your job. I'm like, yeah, how, how do I do it? And she gets this cold look in her eye, and she says, I have some reality for you. People like you don't become astronauts. You are never going to be an astronaut. I'm like, what? She said, you're not smart enough to be an astronaut. You are not athletic enough to be an astronaut. What? Be perfectly blunt, you're not good looking enough to be an astronaut. <laughs> she actually said that to me. And I realized at that moment, that, that people thought it was a joke, that they thought that I was in this fantasy world, that I was a first grader still, 
and they were laughing at me for my dream. So I stopped telling people. I didn't tell anybody probably for, well, a few people, but very few for about 20 years that I wanted to fly in space, that that was going to be my job because I was embarrassed about my dream. And I figured that people would just laugh at me and they wouldn't take me seriously. So as a result, I never met anybody for 20 years that also wanted to be an astronaut. But I was embarrassed and not daunted. Age 23, I finally met the minimum requirements, sent the application, and we'll show that guidance counselor, right? And the letter comes back nine months later. You ever get the thin envelope, the one that, you know, from school? You know, we regret to inform you that, you know, a lot of qualified candidates reject it. Fine, 23, send it in. 24, rejected. 25, rejected. 26, rejected. 27, 28, 29, rejected. When I was 30, they didn't take an application. That was a pretty good year. I'm in my 30s. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I'm embarrassed to tell people I want to be an astronaut. I have to go to my boss, the chairman of the department, and say, I need you to write me a letter of recommendation to be an astronaut. And I pretty much got the same lecture that I had from my guidance counselor in 12th grade. <laughs> Concentrate on what's real. Dress for success. Buckle down and get tenure and stop this ridiculous fantasy. Yes, sir, but could you still write me this letter? 31, rejected. 32, rejected. 33, you're going back to the boss. That was a lousy letter last year. I need a better one. 34, 35, 36, and in, at age 37, I got a phone call instead of a letter, and I was in, and I was going to go to the stars. So I went down there, and I found out all these people are just like me. We're all Pierre's. And we're surrounded and supported by all the roses. And this dream coming true was incredible. And now I want to show you what it's like to have your dream come true. I got to fly three times on the space shuttle. I did four spacewalks. That was the real deal, getting outside. I had two trips to the space station. I built that doggone thing. And here I am saying, we're going tonight. It's the coldest night since the Challenger accident. I, I don't care. We are lifting off tonight, 40 years, this thing's actually going to happen. And here we go. We call the first two minutes shake and bake. So you rattle around pretty good. But then after two minutes, these big boosters drop off, and you have six minutes of, of riding on the main engine. As you can see the three of them lit up there. And it's like an uh, electric car. It's just smooth. The G's built up. You get about three G's in your chest. And eight minutes, you're going 25,000 kilometers an hour. You're seeing the earth from above the sky, and it's just absolutely beautiful. And here's the real dream going outdoors. Because inside the space shuttle, the windows are small and your field of view is framed by them. Even if you put your nose in the glass, there's still a frame. But when you go outside, your visor fills the whole view. And you can stretch out over the earth, over the shuttle, and see the earth in all its glory. And you are a satellite unto yourself. Then you get to work, and, and we built the space station. And, and what is that? It's not rocket science. It's unbolting stuff from the space shuttle and taking a dogger pillar or whatever, sticking it onto the space station, bolting it on. Every single spacewalk, something goes wrong, but we deal with it because we're trained. And then, of course, there's stupid astronaut tricks. 
So here I am starting to spin up. Now, this is what astronauts do in their spare time. And as we go faster and faster, you see old Rick Husband. He's like, my eyeballs are going to pop out of here. <laughs> you can dance in three dimensions. You can dance with point and counterpoint in, in one and the other. We brought a ballerina with us to space. The freedom to fly, it feels like you have magic powers. You're Superman. And one of the favorite things I like to do in space is play with my juice. So you see me taking two juice balls here, and with a, with a bit of string, I, I get them to push together. And, and just, I mean, I think that fluids are so interesting in space. Look at how the surface tension causes that thing to, to just look different. Oh, and then, of course, you have to drink your experiment, which, by the way, tasted terrible, but I pretend it was good because it was TV. <laughs> yeah, right, nuh -uh. <laughs> Landing is just as dynamic. I mean, there's, there's balls of fire popping off the, the, the tail. Nobody even told me that was going to happen. It's like, like tons of paparazzi outside, and the flashes are going off, and then the shuttle hits the density waves of the atmosphere, and the whole thing, bam, the shuttle shakes, and you can feel the wings, and the whole thing feels like it's going to come apart. And is that supposed to happen? And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, density shares. And then St. Elmo's fire starts running around the inside of the window panes. These blue and green and red balls of fire inside the cabin. And I didn't even ask if that was supposed to happen because nobody else was getting upset, so what the heck. And this thing is a glider from 8,000 miles away. We stop putting engine inputs in and we glide from 8,000 miles all the way to a runway you have to hit that thing about plus or minus 100 feet. And guess what? The guy that's flying this thing most of the time has never flown that vehicle before. Because how many chances do you get to practice the space shuttle? <laughs> First time flying, the, 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 the coming in, uh, 21 degrees, seven times steeper than an airliner, twice as fast as an airliner, with no option to go around with a guy whose head is spun up after 10 days in space flying the doggone thing for the very first time, <laughs> it's a testament to training. And you all, I've already found out that you all do this. You went out for a helicopter flight, and the training takes over, and you get the job done. You get the job done, not just okay, but nearly perfect. Everybody makes mistakes, but the mission's accomplished, and and you didn't disappoint the roses. You did it. So I just want to take five on behalf of all the Pierres <laughs> all around the world to the roses. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so very much for taking me to the stars. So I got to do this. I got to go. What should we do now? I put to you that the place we need to go now is Mars. You say, why Mars? There's so many places. Why Mars? And there's lots of reasons to go to Mars. Um, one, not the least of which, is how did a warm, wet world for millions of years become a dry, barren desert? But to me, there's two compelling reasons to go to Mars. The first reason is because I want to know if we're alone. I'd like to know if we're the only life. Because right now, as far as we know, we're it. And I think, I think it's fundamental to sort of human nature to understand whether or not there's somebody else out there. And if we go to Mars and we find the slightest little bit of evidence that there is or ever was life that's fundamentally different than that on Earth, doesn't use RNA or DNA, doesn't use amino acids, whatever it is, if it arose independently on Mars, and we can establish that life started in two places independently, question answered. We know there's, there's, there's 100 billion star systems in this galaxy. Kepler has shown us there are billions and billions of Earths and Mars. ET's out there. We just don't know how to talk to them yet. <laughs> Suppose we go and it's sterile. We look everywhere and we find no life. It's like a surgical instrument, dead. Well, that raises an interesting question. Could it be that we're it? We are truly unique, the only beings in this galaxy. Well, if that's true, then the second reason to go is ever more important. Because the second reason to go, well, first let me say every astronaut, has had the Carl Sagan experience of looking down at the Earth above the sky and understanding 
you know, you all, you understand in an intellectual way, but I'm talking about a visceral understanding that everyone who has ever lived, every bit of life that we know about is there. And then there's, you know, the six of us here. And that life is so fragile. You look at the atmosphere, it is a skin on an apple. Nothing. And one event, asteroid impact, nuclear winter, ecologic runaway, bioterrorism, one event could kill us all, and that's it. But if we go to Mars and we establish a truly independent colony on Mars that doesn't require Earth, we become a multi-planet species, we have ensured the immortality of humans. We will then go, because no one event can wipe us out, we will populate the solar system. We will go to the stars. Humans will be all over this galaxy. Jim Kirk will be born one day. It will happen. And we have the ability and the technology to do it right now. And since I've been here, I realized you all are the crew. You have the culture. You have the environment. You have the experience to do this thing. We can go to Mars. We can be a multi-planet species. There's no technology that's stopping us. Let me show this last. You know, when you're, when you're in orbit and you're, and you're looking down at the Earth, during the day, it's beautiful. Oh my gosh, the Amazonian jungle and the, the, the Tana Namibian desert and the white of the Himalayas are just incredible. But it's night that shows you that human beings exist because cities are little blotches in the, in the daylight. You don't really see them, but at night, the city lights come out and we light up this planet in a way that no other planet in the galaxy is lit, as far as we know. And we can take these lights, we can take this sign of intelligence from just being on the Earth to moving out. We can transform Mars to look like that at night. We can transform the moons of Jupiter to look like that at night we can change this entire galaxy. We as a species, if we will get together and bring the Roses and Pierres together, we have the capability of not only being immortal and being able to, to say we existed forever, but to profoundly change every aspect of our worlds, our solar systems, our galaxy, the universe. We can bring intelligence to the universe, let's get off this rock! Thank you.